Hey everyone, so about half a year ago, I made a video where I took The Only Thing They Fear Is You, the song from the Doom Eternal soundtrack, and I transformed it into an orchestral song using a variety of string instruments and some percussion instruments. Basically, I just transformed the genre so it sounded completely different from the bottom up. Now, that video surged in popularity about two months after it came out and has not stopped. It's probably going to be a, dip a drastically different view count than the screenshot you're currently looking at in the edit of this video. But it, it, it won't stop. It won't stop. So I have received probably over 100 comments by now. Uh, asking me to finish the remix because a lot of people really liked what I did. This video, I'm going to break down kind of section by section what I did. I first want to start by talking about the section that I did make for the short. Uh, fun fact, this is actually true for all the shorts I released in July. I never actually made the full version of any of those songs because all those songs are over a minute long and all YouTube shorts have a cap of 60 seconds. You can't make a video longer than 60 seconds and have it still be a YouTube short. I just took one section of the song I thought people really enjoyed, like a really popular part of the song, and then I transformed that that part of the genre. It usually took me about a couple hours to do each one because I only was making about, I want to say maybe 30 seconds of music each time. So it really did not take me that long to make those shorts. A lot of people just thought I had made the entire song and I was only showcasing a small portion for the YouTube short. And they were like, hey, when's it releasing? And I'm like, and I'm, I'm sitting here like, they, they don't realize I didn't make the whole thing. I only made the section you're hearing. <laughs> but, you know, this video got so popular I, I and so many people asked for it. I decided to give in and actually decide to make the full song. Uh, this year, what you're seeing on my screen is what I made for the short. It's uh, this entire section from measure one to 21. Uh, this is the part I made for the short. It's only this. The, the project just suddenly stopped after this measure. But I went ahead and did all of it for your entertainment. First things first, let me briefly go over my thought process for the original uh, 21 measures, the part that I made back in July. So this song consists of three main parts. Really, there's only three. There's the or really there's two main parts. There's the drums and there's the guitar because both of those instruments in this song are so, um, are so prominent. They're so prominent and so overwhelmingly layered on top of each other that the two parts are really what make up the entire song. Like the two parts alone create a whole song because they're just so beefy in their sound. That did make my transcribing job a bit easy because I didn't actually had a, have a lot of notes I needed to transcribe because in most of the sections there was only one melody and nothing else. So it did make my job pretty easy in terms of transcribing, but um, the only reason why it still took me a while is because the song is just so freaking long. So with this first section, um, I did explain this in the short, but I really just wanted this to sound as big as possible because I... You know, by design, orchestral instruments tend to have a softer sound. That's just kind of how they're built. That's just kind of how they work. So I was like, how do I create something that sounds remotely similar to the original song? Because the two things I'm creating are polar opposites and sound and like timbre and stuff. So I was like, the only way I can even get close to representing the actual like correct way that this should be perceived is I have to make something that just sounds overbearingly powerful and what I did to achieve this was just layering the string instruments so much to the point where they're just so loud. There is that synth melody that occasionally plays. There and in a variety of other places. Um, that is occupied by these two violins. I have the, the, the melody instrument was always the melody synth, I should say, was always occupied by viol violins three and four, which were not panned at all. They were always in the center. Uh, the reason why I did two is because one of them was an octave higher, so they were always doubled in octaves. I always have one that was playing a lower octave, and one that was playing a higher octave. And the two of them together created a nice, a nice layered sound. So that's kind of neat. Every other instrument is playing like basically the same part. I have um, the cello is playing the low octave part. 
This is probably this is probably the the instrument that's closest resembling to the actual pitch of the guitar. But you notice that there's two of them, and they're both doing the same thing. This is the case with all of the instruments over here. I have them both. I have all of them doubled, and they're all panned slightly right and slightly left. But the point is, there's always two of them. I always double all of it. So violos are playing an octave higher than the cellos. And um, the violins are actually playing two octaves above that. And then the final layer is the basses, which are playing an octave lower than the cellos. This is the really deep part. And they're also playing pizzicato because they can't really play fast while staccato at the same time. So all of these pieces put together creates the massive layer, the, the massive like six octave layer that is the guitar part. And I did this for the entire song. This is a consistent trend, as you see with all the soloed regions right now. It is a consistent trend throughout the entire song that this is the layering system I used. I wanted the guitar part to always have a crap ton of layering to it. We drop on down to the percussion section. This one I didn't really care nearly as much for. I just kind of tried to recreate the kind of feel of the drum set part with orchestral instruments. In this case, it's a to crash cymbal, two different varieties of crash cymbals actually. There's a there's two different crash cymbals in this track. There's this one. There's uh, this crash cymbal. Hold on, I had the whole thing uh, playing at once. And there's also this one. Two different crash cymbals, and sometimes they both play. Sometimes it's just one of them. But two variety of crash cymbals. I have a I have a suspended cymbal which plays all the, all over the place. A snare drum. And a uh, timpani. And I kind of just wrote very rudimentary parts. I didn't really put a whole lot of effort and thought into these. I kind of just wrote parts that I felt like would fit both the intensity and also still fit the genre that we're in. So... Not very crazy parts, because the orchestral, it's a little known fact that orchestral music likes to forget the percussion section exists entirely, and I, as a percussionist, am mildly offended by this. If you're a percussionist and you play an orchestra, I am sorry, they, you just don't get any good parts ever. So, I, I'm honestly giving the percussion section probably five times the amount of notes they would usually play in an orchestral song. But that pretty much covers the entire original section. The original uh, 20 bars from the uh, short. Now we shall move on to the new stuff. The stuff you haven't heard yet. Oh, also for those who are wondering, because I remember I got a lot of comments about this too. Uh, these aren't real string instruments. These are these are all a virtual plugin. They're, they're actually, it's all a sample library. It's a massive sample library that comes pre-installed with logic called Studio Strings. So like in, in this region here, I have all these MIDI notes. These are just MIDI notes. Like this is just like MIDI data. It's just notes written into a into a machine essentially. And basically it reads the note and its information, the note information, and then it plays a sample based off the information it's provided. In the case of the string instrument, it reads um, its length, its velocity, and in, in the case of this specific sample library, also an articulation. Because uh, all these string instruments have a list of articulations that you can use as well. But it, none, of the, none of this is real instruments. It's all just a absolutely massive sample library that um, can be customized so much to the point where it sounds like it's real. That's the thing with sample libraries, is that sample libraries, if it's just a single sample or a few samples, it's not going to sound that realistic. But once you get this like nitty gritty with it, and you start adding a lot of different samples for a lot of different states... It, get, it starts getting a lot realistic because you can customize it like to a very high degree. And that high level of customization makes it feel like it's real. Moving on to section two. Uh, after the chorus finishes playing for the first time, uh, we enter a breakdown section number one, kind of. This one I did the same principles before. The guitar part is just being represented by literally every string instrument. So that's what this is. Mm -hmm. 
And here, here, what I did is uh, this little viola, this little viola, this little uh, viola flourish exists here, because in the actual song, there's like a synth thing playing, and then it's and then it just follows exactly what the other instrument's doing. Another thing I wanted to do is that because this synth cuts in, but the synth is playing a very similar thing to the, to the, the um, it's playing a very similar to thing to what the guitar is playing. And also its formant is getting shifted up, which essentially means it's it's allowing higher frequencies to go and it's going like that's called formant shifting when you do that. So its formant is shifting up, which means like it's it's squeezing the higher frequencies so we hear more of them. And the way I do this, this actually happens a lot of times in the song where the formant gets shifted up in an instrument. And the way I execute that through this instrument is because I'm layering the entire pe the entire like part over like six octaves. Essentially, my 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 solution to this was to just make it so that the um the higher octaves become louder than the lower octaves, so it feels like the entire thing is shifting to one section of the giant layer. And I do that I do that uh, a little bit more later, but here I intentionally hold off on using the higher instruments until this measure because the higher frequencies haven't fully caught up in the original recording. And then here we just have the chorus again. This is literally the same exact thing as before. I just copy pasted it. Only thing that's different about this one is that in this one, the synth doesn't end. The synth doesn't fade out in the, in the last one. The synth fades out initially, but then rises back up. So that's the only thing that's different about this one is that this note goes all the way to the end. <laughs> The only thing that's different about that one um then we have this weird breakdown section which uh is honestly i'm actually really proud of this section because it actually sounds really similar to the original so this is what the original sounds like so once again we have that formant shifting where there you hear the full guitar's frequency you hear the boom boom like that's the full guitar sound but then after that second note it cuts the entire low end out, and all you're hearing is the high end of the guitar. So my, my way of doing that is I essentially just dropped the lower layers af after those first two notes. And now it's only using the top layers as opposed to the bottom ones. So the synth right now is doing this weird effect. It's going like, Wee! it's doing that in the background. And it does it again here. So I just represent that with a little something called tremolo. So first off, I have a glissando up note here, which is the other fake portamento I can do. Um, and then this is called a tremolo note. Tremolo is when the string player uh, moves the bow. It's still playing only one note. They're only playing one note, but they're moving the bow back and forth on the string really quickly. And it creates this kind of like sound. And it's really, it's it, it, it adds tension to the sound of the note. And now here we have yet another formant shifting section. So this is a this this is a goes right back to the melody from before, but the difference now is that the uh, the the entire phrase is slowly formant shifting up, starts off in this low end, and by the time we get to the end, it's all high frequencies. So the entire thing's kind of rising in this entire phrase. And how I did that is is literally there are crescendos. Um, all of the higher frequency instruments are slowly getting louder, and all the lower frequency instruments are slowly getting quieter as this phrase continues. And they all come back at the end. Now we reach a very interesting part of the song. In this part of the song, originally, at bar 53, there is a very, very interesting sounding part where all the instruments drop out and the guitar gets bit crushed past the utter reaches of hell and turns into this.
Now, I sat here trying to think how on earth I could represent this in an orchestral fashion, because this is just full-on electronic noise. Like, what do I do? So, my only idea I had was I decided to use the one articulation, the one main articulation I had yet to use. Pizzicato! If you are unfamiliar with what pizzicato is, it's essentially when the player, the string player, uh, abandons the bow entirely and plays the string instrument, plays the strings with their fingers. They hold the notes, they, they hold their fingers on the note, and they like pluck the string with the tip of their fingers. And it makes a nice sound. And I decided to just make that what the section was. Pizzicato section. Once again, that tremolo's back. I also decided to um to spread it spread the whole thing out across every instrument because the synthesizer here is jumping up and down from low to high octaves like crazy. So I decided the best way to represent that was to just have the melody play across all the instruments and it would just like they'd all take turns playing. Um, and then it's just, uh, the section here is pretty much the exact same thing, but now they're all playing staccato again. And also the drums are back, yay! Now we reach probably my favorite part of the whole song. It's the last time the main melody plays, but there's something different about it this time. There's a single change that's made. Um, halfway through the phrase, the bass, the bass uh, note, which has been E flat this entire time, it's just been this, the entire song. It has not changed once. For the first time in the entire song, the bass note changes and it sounds so cool in the original song. And it's also the last time you hear this melody. Then we enter the official breakdown section. The, the the percussion actually doesn't come back for a while now, but uh, we enter the official breakdown. Um, this 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 melody here, this melody here that the synth is playing. Took me absolute eons to transpose. It's so fast and it's so chromatic, it took forever to figure out what these notes were, but I eventually got it. And, um, same formant shift dealing again, the, the, the synth starts at a high formant shift and starts lowering its way down, so I decided to start with the high parts of the layer and slowly fade in the lower parts. Now we enter some really weird chromatic stuff. So the uh, guitar is back, actually. Guitar has been a uh, guitar. Guitar now is being represented by everything except the higher notes, because in this case, the guitar is playing very low and it's not being overlaid by anything. It's kind of like a weird. They didn't done a weird effect on the guitar. Um, and then the guitar's high end starts to come back here, which is why I have the the top layer absent in this first half. The guitar is doing something interesting. The guitar is, um, it's playing high notes at an accent, but then it's like half, it's like strum hitting. It's like, it's just like, they're just like tapping the string very lightly on the lower notes, but it's playing a bunch of low notes. It's just being strummed instead of actually fully like played. So to do that, I essentially just put pizzicato notes and this is only being played on the bass. The bass is the only instrument playing these notes. These instruments, these instruments up here are only playing the accents. But uh, this, this is the only one that's actually playing the full part. With the bass notes and everything. Uh, this is also the only time I did pitch bend, because it was like the only time I could do it where it didn't sound weird. So, feels kind of uncanny to put it here and nowhere else, but it's fine. <laughs> And 
this section is essentially the same thing again, but now all the instruments are fully in. And this is a weird section here where the uh, formant shift goes really high and the effect gets really strong. So I decided to just uh, drop the bass entirely and just move the entire bass part, the part with like all the notes being played and whatnot. I decided to move that entire part up an octave and being played on the cellos, which has this effect. Little mini pizzicato section here, because, I don't know, it just felt fitting. Um, then we have the part that was kind of weird sounding, because this is the part where the guitar goes full portamento, and there's nothing but pitch bend here. There's like hardly any consistent notes the entire time the 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 notes are just are just being bent. And because I can't really do pitch bend in a way that sounds good, uh, I had to I had to compromise by essentially just approximating the nearest notes. So this section does sound admittedly a bit weird. It's like my least favorite part of the whole orchestral arrangement, but it's I just had to do it. It's just the compromise that had to be made. Same deal here. Except now that synth part is back. Also, new percussion section. Yay. Let's give that a listen. A lot of, a lot of upbeats in the snare here. Then we enter the final section, the final, the final melody. Which is uh this this very well known melody. Very, very, very nice melody. I love this melody. Um This section is pretty straightforward. I didn't really I didn't really do any trickery here. This is kind of just a direct recreation of the main song. Just following I pretty much just followed all the conventions I've been using up to this point. So now we enter the grand finale of my of my arrangement. So this part's very aggressive and it's very long. And it goes on for like the entire rest of the song essentially. And for this section, I essentially held nothing back. I um the crashes play on literally every beat of every bar. The complex the complex parts of the percussion section are gone and they're simply just playing on the beat now. That's all that's happening. And the string instruments have gone full sustain. So they're not playing staccato notes, they're not playing like short notes anymore. They're playing they're playing all their notes for the full duration. And it makes for this very very nice sounding, very very loud finale. Remember when I first transposed this? I did this entire thing in one go because this and this this uh melody loops for literally like a minute and a half. Look at all these loops. Um and then the melody here doesn't change at all. It just uh the timing of it gets messed around and the octave gets jumped. So I pretty much just did this entire section and then listened to it after I had written the whole thing already because it's such a it was such an easy section to do. It was pretty much copy pasting the whole time. So I decided to listen to it after I had finished the whole thing. And I and I and I was listening to it, and in the original song, this has a very, very aggressive, very, very like chilling kind of feel. Like it just has that a very aggressive vibe to it. Here I had this weird feeling where it almost felt like it was kind of sad because the violin playing the melody has such a soft timbre to it that it almost makes it it almost makes it sound like there's something like upsetting happening. 
Like instead of it being like a like a giant epic fight scene, it almost it almost sounds like the main character is about to die. Like it just sounds kind of somber almost. It's weird. <laughs> And then we have one last problem to take care of, and that is the ending of the song, which is this buildup of drums. Very intense drums, followed by a vocal part. So, this was a bit hard to think of because, uh, how do I represent vocals in an orchestral format, aside from a choir, which is the exact polar opposite of what this is supposed to sound like? Because listen to this. That's not a choir. I also don't have nearly a manly enough voice to uh, actually recreate those sounds. So, my compromise, and also because they're not really singing at, a, like, a consistent pitch, my compromise was to just play it on on tremolo strings with just a really gnarly sounding chord. That was my compromise. Uh, this last note's actually what's called a trill. It's different than a tremolo. They're still doing the fast movement with the bow, but now the note actually is changing. They're, they're not just keeping the same note and moving the bow fast. They're, they're moving the bow fast and moving the note up and down really fast. It's called a trill. Very, very, a very, very nice effect that I like to use sometimes. And then for the drums, I just used the best, the best sample drums I could find. It sounds nowhere as good as the original because the original actually uses real drums, but... It's like the closest I can get. I don't actually own these drums. I wish I did, but I don't. Yeah, but that pretty much sums up the whole thing. That last section is a very long section. This is literally like almost two full minutes of the song. Like, look, look, if I zoom out and show you everything, look at how much of the song is just that last part. It's a it's a large chunk. Uh, just just for the sake of archival purposes, I'm going to zoom out so you can see everything in the project at once. So here you go. For for those of you who like to take screenshots of very massive things, including I'm actually one of these people. Here's the entire project in one frame. All right, now that we've um, now that we've uh, like I I've broken down how I've done every section. I will now play the entire thing for all of you uninterrupted from start to finish. Uh, the uh, I am gonna be playing it uh in an audio file format, so you're not gonna be able to see this entire project. You're gonna see just an audio file and an empty logic session because I had to master it. All right, so here it is, the completely uninterrupted. Um, do more casual remix.
All right, everyone, thank you for watching. Uh, if you're wondering, it is going to be coming to Spotify and all the other streaming services soon. Uh, I want people to see this video first. Um, also, because I haven't set it up and I plan on release I plan on releasing this video before I set it up. So it should be coming to streaming services early January. I will keep you posted on that, though. It, it will be there, just not immediately. So thank you all for watching and I'll see you guys later. It's my first actual video. I, I don't know what I'm going to do in the next video. I'm, I'll think of something. I don't I mean, I have no video ideas.